machine, you'll find it's MD5 SUM, MD5 SUM. What it'll do is take a data stream and create an MD5 hash out of it. So I'm just going to send this drive through MD5. It'll take a couple seconds to spin through this, and it will generate this hash for me. I'm doing this before I actually image the disk. This is an important piece of practice. Some forensic investigators image the drive and then compare the hash that results of the image they make and the drive that they imaged. But there's a little problem with that. Do you know that your process didn't change the drive? It's a little gap. It, you don't often get held up in a court about this kind of thing. But it is actually pretty important. This is like the before and after picture and demonstrating that there's been no change. So this is that piece between physical chain of custody and electronic chain of custody. This is where we're trying to glue those two together. That's exactly right. All right, so it comes up and it gives me a hash here. Now, if I were doing an investigation, of course, I would now document this. How would I document it? Personally, what I prefer to do is I usually use a tool called script that's built into all Unix systems. You don't have to have Unix to do forensics, of course. I prefer to do forensics on Unix machines, and I'll tell you why. The simplest reason why, especially for imaging, is that I know and have a lot of control over exactly how this system is going to interact with that drive. In a Windows system, that is not true. All bets are off. So there's all kinds of things that can interfere. And then you also deal with device driver issues and all that kind of stuff over in the Windows side. In the Unix side, that's not an issue. So I would have actually started by running the script command. And now everything that I type and everything that shows up on the screen is going to be stored into a file named TypeScript. So for instance, in an actual investigation, I would have probably started by typing date, see when I got started. I would have then done the MD5 hash here that I just performed. This value, the resulting value, would now be stored in that TypeScript file. Now I can image the drive. So I'll do the same command, dd, input file equals, there's lab slash disk1, block size is 512. But I'm now going to store it into another file. The output file is the suspect disk, whatever you want to call it. Off it goes. So this will take it another 15 or 20 seconds. What did it take last time here? Uh, 56 seconds. Yes. Absolutely. One of the most important things, if, if you ever do end up doing this kind of work, whether it's it, you're doing it professionally or you're working for a company, there's an incident going on, and you say, hey, you know what, I took the class. I can, I can do something. I can at least seize the evidence for you. Process is extremely important. One of the things that, uh, that they'll look for if you end up in a court is that you've got a documented process that you follow in order to collect, handle, and analyze evidence. Do you have to follow that process step by step? No. That might seem strange to you. I just said we have to have a process, but now I'm saying we don't have to follow it. You do have to have a process. The important part of the process, the having that process document, is being able to say that when I collect a disk, here's the process I have. I take it out of evidence. I take it over to my workstation, I start up the script command, I bring the drive on, I do an MD5 sum. So this is all documented in a process. If it's in the process, I don't have to do anything more than what the process document says, and I've got my collection here with the script. If I deviate from that standard process, that's where documentation becomes extremely important. And in digital forensics, there are lots of times you're going to have to deviate from your standard. But having a process, having a documented process, is what's trying to glue us back to that physical chain of custody. All right, so it's now created the image here. We have two more things we'd like to do. Let's start by running an MD5 against the image that we created. And what we're looking for is that it's the same as the, image, as the MD5 sum that we had off the disk. It should always be the same. If this is a live system, we're looking at a live hard drive. Taking an MD5 sum isn't worth your time. You would never take a look at the live drive and do an MD5 sum. Because what's happening on the system while you're doing the image? It's changing. The MD5 sum is going to be different every time. You would MD5 sum the resulting image, but not the original drive. It wouldn't be worth your time. 
what if this number is different and we're dealing with a dead system? That doesn't look good for us, right? Now it looks like I changed it. If you ever did this and you came back with a different value, what you need to do is take a step back. Don't just start typing again. Take a step back and look at everything you've got, how everything's hooked up, everything you've typed, and make sure everything you've typed makes sense. Make sure you haven't done anything, anything inadvertently. All right, let's say we've done that. We've taken a step back. No, disk is right protected. There's, all I did was image it. Should it be different? So this becomes a, a deterministic process, right? I mean, if, if it's all right protected, it's, it can't be different. So if it is different, what must be true? But, but it is. I verified it's right protected. What could be wrong? Your commands. Maybe my commands. I've re-verified them. They're all correct. Disk error. Disk error. Could it be there's a damaged part of this disk? Now, disk damage can, can come in different shapes and sizes. There's actually an interesting website out there. It's a, it's a company, a data recovery company. What they've done is recorded all the different wonderful sounds hard drives make when they're failing. So you can, uh, it's sort of a self-diagnostic thing, so you can figure out if it's worth sending you their drive. So uh, you may have a drive problem where there's, a, there's an audible sound. You may even be able to feel the vibration when the disk head moves. It's like whack into the side of your drive. That's not a good sign. But it could also be that there's something failing but it hasn't failed yet. More often than not, when there is a disk failure, you can't get data off the drive. Have you ever had that happen? And, you know, I'm not talking about data recovery here, but just, you know, the disk failed. You had your important paper on it, it's always like the term paper or something. You couldn't get the paper off. The professor never believes you, I know. So uh, it's more often than not, not a physical problem. It's not the drive heads, it's unless you drop the computer, you know, that can be a drive problem. It's not that the drive won't spin up. More often than not, it's that the controller has failed. There's a bunch of chips on there. You know, it gets pretty hot inside your computer. Heat is not usually good for chips. So if there's any kind of uh, manufacturing defect over time, that's going to come clear with, with heat. I'm actually going to bring some samples that, uh, that are like that in the next couple of classes. I've got a couple of drives. They're actually exactly the same type of drive. One of the controller boards has failed. And one of the symptoms of this is that every time you do an MD5 sum on it, you don't get discrete errors, but your MD5 sum is different every time. On your system, the symptom of that would be that your files are becoming corrupt. The actual data on the disk is not corrupt. It's the disk controller when it's trying to read it is corrupting the data. You know what the easiest way to fix that problem is? Find another drive of exactly the same model and size take the controller board off it, and put it on the drive that's failing. And you know what? You just repaired the drive. That is the most common problem that happens, is that you have a, a controller problem. So in that kind of a case, you may see the, the MD5 sums changing. You'd need to figure that out. And now, how would I demonstrate that? What I would do, now I have to do this anyway, so let me just run the command here. To finish this off, what I need to do is just run that again through MD5 and demonstrate that the disk hasn't changed. So if I saw that there was a difference here, what I would now do is run that same command three or four times in a row and just demonstrate that it changes every time I do it. What am I proving? That, that you have uh, a legitimate yeah. that, that you didn't do it. I didn't do it. That's what I'm proving. It wasn't me. There's something wrong with this disk. So just as proof, here's what happened. Uh, we'll talk more about damaged drives sometime later in the class, uh, probably one of the last sessions, and ways to get around that. There is a really handy utility out there called DD Rescue. There's actually two versions of this tool. One of them is uh, put out by the Free Software Foundation. That's the one you're looking for. It's actually spelled DD underscore rescue. It's specifically designed to be able to recover data off of failing drives, particularly physically failing drives, because if it's a controller, you should replace the controller. What it will do is repeatedly try to read the data and get closer and closer to it from both directions to see if it can get the, the most data it can. So that's a way you can handle that. In this particular case, we've successfully imaged it. I can see that there's 
no problems here. All the MD5s are the same. I can now exit out of that, uh, that session there, and the file TypeScript now contains an example, or, well, let me cat it out. It'll look a little nicer. Now has all of the things that I've done. It just has documentation for, me for everything that I've done. So actually recording that data is not that hard. Very, very easy.